Great. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so just test out the mic. Is this good? Can you guys hear me or do I need to get it closer? A little closer because this is a big difference. No, that works. All right, great. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, we had you know, a beautiful drive up over the pass uh, from Route 100 today, and I haven't been here in a long time to this neck of the woods, so uh, just gorgeous to be down in, in the Ripton area. So <clears throat> as you all well know, living in such an incredible place like this, Vermont is a wild place, right? There's still a lot of wildness left to this state. Um, oftentimes it's portrayed as just kind of the village greens and town centers and those things that you see in the tourism industry in Vermont, but there still is a wildness that remains in this state. And to prove it, I want to show one of the native species that we have here, the timber rattlesnake. So this, to me, epitomizes, probably more than anything else, the wildness that remains here in Vermont. Um, how many people knew that we have native timber rattlesnakes here? Pretty much everyone. You guys are a well-informed crew. Is this the whole Conservation Commission? Is that all there is in the room tonight? Yeah. <clears throat> Not many of them, as we well know, but the fact that they're still here, to me, really speaks to the wildness that's left in this state. But, as many of you know, as informed conservationists, we are slowly losing that wildness in Vermont. We lose it one road and building and parking lot at a time. So we're developing our landscape at a rate about two and a half times the rate of our population growth. Um, putting our homes in places that were formerly homes for wildlife. <clears throat> and this is kind of that classic development pattern that we're seeing uh, here in Vermont these days, you know? The, the big house up with the long driveway in the woods and the huge lawn, and they're kind of all over the place and they're becoming more numerous. And this is kind of that pattern that we see. So lawns are the single largest irrigated crop in the United States. They take up about 49,000 square miles, about the size of New York State, right? And although they're green, as we well know, they're not habitat, right? They're not a place that wildlife can thrive. So let's look at that on a landscape scale. So this is my area up in Stowe. Um, my house is actually right at this intersection right there in the Stowe Hollow area. So this is some satellite imagery from 1962 showing what the landscape looked back then. And here you have highlighted in green some of the larger forest blocks. 1974, you start to see some roads going up into the woods. 1980, even more. By 96, you start seeing some of those houses that I just kind of mentioned, the long driveways, the big lawns, getting up there in the woods. 2007, and then here's the most recent one, 2011. So you can see what was large past patch of intact forested habitat has been chopped up into smaller and smaller fragments. And here's what that looks like statewide. So the yellow on this map is all of the agricultural areas in the state, and the red is all of the urban areas. So on top of that, we add our roads, and then on top of that, all of the houses and buildings and parking lots and other development. And you can see that there are, again, few large stretches of intact habitat, or forested habitat that remain in the state. Um, zooming out, just one more step. This is fascinating. And this is something that I found from an article recently in Forbes magazine. This person did a study on land use changes based on all these different data sources, USDA, and basically mapped how we use land in the United States. And this is it. You can see, by and large, a lot of it is cow and pasture range. That's kind of the biggest one, right? Now, if you take this and you highlight all the things that are somewhat still in a natural state, you can see it's actually a relatively small percentage of the country that still remains as something that would be in any way usable to most wildlife. Now, some of the cow and pasture range and the, the cornfield and things like that, you know, geese and other animals, we use this. But in terms of what's kind of still remaining somewhat natural, this is what it looks like. Now, I will point out, I think it's funny on the map, you can see that barley for beer is a significant portion of the land use in the country. And as a fan of Vermont microbrews, I'm kind of OK with that section. But the rest of it, we should really take a closer look at, all right? Um, so this is kind of incredible. I mean, if you, if you zoom out one more step before we dive back into Vermont, Taking all of the biomass on the face of the earth, all of the biomass on the planet, that means that all of the living things, if you put them on a scale like this, quite literally, if you took all of the people and put them on one side, and all of the terrestrial mammals, so everything from a shrew all the way up to elephants, every single one of them on the face of the earth, we would outweigh them by 10 times, right? Now if you took our livestock, the things that support us, and put them on that side of the scale instead of us, they would outweigh the natural terrestrial mammals by 25 times. Um, so 
there's about 50 million square miles of ice-free earth on the planet, and we've directly transformed more than half. About 27 million square miles has been transformed by people. So we've basically kind of taken over, by and large, the face of the earth. And what has that resulted in? Well, it's resulted in what scientists are calling the sixth great extinction, right? Um, has anyone read this book by Elizabeth Colbert called The Sixth Extinction? Fantastic book. I highly recommend it. Um, so there have been five mass extinction events before in the history of Earth. There was just a great paper that came out, and can you guys still hear when I back away? Yeah. In, the, in the article, in the journal Science, talking about this one, and they said that this one has uh, definitively been placed back. Can I just do it without that then? This one has, has been tied back to climate change. So the great dying was actually caused because uh, the Earth's temperature rose by 17 degrees. It acidified the oceans. We lost 95% of our marine mammals at the time. Um, so this has happened before. And when you look at the effect of that, not only are we are losing species, but some of our charismatic megafauna, as we like to call them in science, right? Some of the big uh, wildlife that you learn about as a child, our lions and tigers and bears and those types of things, it, where they do still exist, if they have not gone extinct, they only exist in these small patches that kind of remain behind uh, what was a formerly sweeping range across vast areas of the earth. Here's another one, elephants, right? Again, you can see it's just these little tiny dots in the map that are kind of getting smaller at the edges as time goes on. You know, there's actually nine times as many. Do you, have you ever seen these Sophie giraffe squeeze toys that little babies use? I've got a two-year-old and we just use them. They're these little plastic toys. There's nine times as many Sophie the giraffe toys made in France every year as there are actual giraffes in the wild, right? And then one more, one more charismatic marathon, the, in, uh, the Asian rhino. So again, this one has six dots on this map where they still exist on the face of the earth. One of them right here, this is where this photo was taken in Royal Shitwan National Park on the border of Nepal and India, is one of those six dots. And so you can see the range of these species is shrinking pretty dramatically. And then bringing it back to the states here, one of the ones that we're really concerned about are our pollinators. Um, there was an article in the New York Times recently about the Maha I think it's, I don't know how to pronounce it exactly, the Mahakan Valley in China where they've lost their pollinators to the degree that they have to hand pollinate their fruit trees. It's kind of our version, their version of uh, Central California, you know, where they grow a lot of their fruits and vegetables and they pay people now to go from one tree to the next and hand pollinate apple trees because they no longer have pollinators there. Um, so let's circle back around to how this, how this, you know, kind of great mass extinction event is playing out here in Vermont. So, Moose are really the flagship species for species that are being affected by climate change. This is our own charismatic megafauna, right? Um, this is kind of where our climate story begins here in Vermont. So moose didn't start, uh, climate change wasn't the first stressor for moose. So let's kind of back up a little bit and put this story in context for moose. So pre-1800s, we had moose here in Vermont. We had deer, but not nearly as numerous as they are now. They were mostly in the southern part of the state. And then we had natural predators for, for these animals, right? So uh, mountain lions, um, uh, wolves, and Native Americans. The 1800s come around. The predators, by and large, get moved out or wiped out or drastically reduced in numbers when it comes to Native Americans. Um, and our large ungulates were wiped out uh, in the mid-1800s as a result of the forest being cleared. So we lost uh, most of the forest in Vermont as a result of the sheep industry, actually. Um, they cleared uh, from about 95% forested to about a third forested. So there was tremendous erosion. Um, we lost a lot of different species. Turkey, bear, otter, beaver, lynx, marten were all pushed out of the state at that time. Atlantic salmon, muskies, elk, caribou, a couple of our native species that have still not come back. Um, by 1878, the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department, a precursor of the Fish and Wildlife Department, reintroduced deer into the state of Vermont. Um, we brought in 17 deer into Rutland County from New York State. Um, by the 1980s, we started seeing moose back again in the state as, as we regained forest cover. And then by the mid-2000s, moose were kind of everywhere. They were severely overabundant, actually, right? Because as we mentioned, there were these native predators that were keeping them in check before, and now all of a sudden, moose are coming into a state where they not only have no native predators, but no one has been eating moose food 
for basically 150 years, right? Deer and moose do browse in, uh, some of the same things, but moose can reach a lot higher. They, they eat different things. And so you've got a forest full of moose food and no one really controlling their numbers. There were more moose in the Vermont in the year 2005 than there have been since the last ice age. So there were three problems with that. One is we've got this overabundant moose population, right? They're, they're much more highly dense than they've ever been on the landscape. The second is that a result of both climate change to some degree, um, but land use changes is the big one. There are way more deer in the state and they're more spread out in the state than they ever have been historically. And then the third, the big one is climate change. So we'll talk about he, how each of those are affecting moose. So first, that overabundant moose population. They basically started uh, browsing themselves out of house and home and all of the species that live alongside of them. They created what I call French poodle trees, right? Where you've got the little tuft at the very top and that's really the only thing that's able to grow, right? So you can see, I mean, that's a, that's a six foot tall man and that's how high a moose can reach. I don't know if anyone's familiar with Aldo Leopold's quote about how uh, overabundant deer grazing to the height of a saddle horn, he called it, right? It's the same type of thing. We were seeing this phenomena uh, in the Northeast Kingdom especially. Now this is a photo that I took last winter in one area and a few of the areas of the state that still have pretty dense moose populations, right? But think about all of the other things that try to live in the forest alongside of it. Think of a, boar, a bird species that likes to nest about six feet off the ground, right? So pretty severe consequences of the forest by having this overabundant moose population. So the first thing we did was try to deliberately and aggressively reduce the moose population. You know, there's sometimes the critics of the Fish and Wildlife Department will be like, oh, they just sold off permits and shot moose and, and now we're in trouble, right? Well, if anything, this probably should have happened more aggressively and earlier because there were a few issues with having moose that abundant in addition to this decimation of the habitat. One is that now they're interacting with deer more often and deer carry this parasite known as brain worm. And this is what ends up happening to moose. It, it, it literally infects their brain. They uh, start spinning around in circles. They get really disoriented. They become emaciated. And so in the places in Vermont where we have moose and deer interact, quite, uh, overlap quite a bit, we're seeing a lot of brain worm. The other, as we mentioned, is these warming temperatures. So this is data here from Vermont. <clears throat> you can see that temperatures by and large are warming more quickly on the lower end. So our nighttime lows are getting higher and our winter temperatures are getting higher faster. And you can see that we've got shorter winters as well. So this is up in the Northeast Kingdom on Joe's Pond where they have that contest every year. They put the safe out on the ice and when it falls through, there's like a clock or something that it tells them when it happened. And so everybody in town puts in for the pool. And you can see that even just since 1988, there's been a downward trend in the number of days since January 1st, where that happens. And this is really what's affecting the moose most of all, because <clears throat> this parasite known as the winter tick, very different than the black-legged tick, which is the one that we all know from Lyme disease and other diseases. This is a winter tick. It's found predominantly on moose in the state. And it's highly affected by climate change. There are two points in its, uh, in its life cycle. Um, during the fall, when it climbs up onto plants and tries to find a moose to spend a winter on, if it's uh, kind of a, a warm, not wet fall, a warm, dry fall, it's easier for them to do that and they'll, they'll find moose in larger numbers. But the big thing is this time of year, in the spring, <clears throat> if, when it disengages on the moose to go lay its eggs, if it falls onto bare ground, it's likely to survive. If it falls onto snow, which historically there was in, in, moose, in the core of moose habitat, um, it's likely to die. And so as a result of that overly dense moose population we talked about, where there's more moose and they're passing these ticks to each other much more quickly, and as a result of climate change, by having bare ground earlier in the year, the ticks have really started to explode. And they're caught, it's to the point where it's the driving factor for the decline in the moose population. <clears throat> One of the things we're doing that, about that right now is we're in the midst of a three-year study where we went out and radio collared a bunch of moose and it looked like he jumped on the back of the moose but that's a head cam so just to give you a heads up he did not jump on the back of the moose from a helicopter. <clears throat> but they go out and tie the moose up. These guys are, some of them are actually literally professional bull wranglers. They're very good at handling these large animals. This is gutsy. Look at that. He's got a helicopter hovering above his head and he hooks it up to it to weigh the moose. So that's a moose calf there, 
or yearling, I guess. <clears throat> in about 10 minutes, without using any sedation, they're able to get a blood sample, put the radio collar on, untie them, take the, uh, the eye patches off, give them a boost, and off it goes. <clears throat> and we collared 60 moose up in the Northeast Kingdom, and we're able to kind of follow them uh, for the duration of this study. Now the calves, by and large, were following, at least for about half of them, until the end of their life. Because about half of them, we're finding, are dying each year. And so we wanted to go in and find out what's killing them. We suspected it was probably largely driven by the ticks, but we wanted to be sure. And so last spring, I joined the moose crew out in the field um, to go check out uh, a moose that had died. They have the, the uh, mortality signal when they haven't moved for a long time. And we immediately go out there and try to do a necropsy on them to see what's ca what cause of death is. And you can see, <clears throat> here's the footprints in the snow. And as you get close to these moose, who are uninjured, you start seeing the drops of blood in the snow. As you get even closer, you can see some of these places where the moose have laid down, and all of that is blood um, from where the ticks have been eating them. And then when you finally get to the moose, this is what you see. <clears throat> you see where they've rubbed their fur uh, off the sides of their bodies because the ticks have irritated them so much. There are places where the ticks are lined up so close together, and this one wasn't even that bad compared to some, but there are some places where it looks like kernels of corn on the side of an ear of corn. They're so tight to each other. These are all the engorged females that you can see <clears throat> there. And we've done counts on these, found as many as 50 or 60,000 ticks on a single moose, right? So these moose are dying as a, through a combination of hypothermia from rubbing all their fur off to try to get the, the ticks off, and anemia meaning blood loss. They're basically, it would be like going into the Red Cross and donating a pint of blood once or twice a day, every single day, without ever stopping, right? But on top of all this, climate change, even if the ticks went around, climate change is kind of pushing moose in a stressful direction anyway. Because moose are a very cold weather adapted species. They start to get heat stress in the high 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And they'll actually start panting by the low to mid 60s. <clears throat> So one of the uh, projections for climate change by the end of the century is that we're going to start to get more days over 90 degrees Fahrenheit, so more of these hot summer days, which are really stressful for moose. That's the time of year when everything is greened up out in the countryside and when moose are able to feed and really bulk up for the winter. But more and more, they'll be spending their time trying to cool off rather than, rather than feeding because they really can't deal with this high temperature. So it may just be um, that we're going to have to start seeing moose at lower densities in the state. The one thing we can do to control these parasites, people say, you know, well, why don't you guys go out <clears throat> and put like a, a tick collar around them? Well, there's like 1,800 moose in the state. It would be hard to do that every year. Um, they haven't developed moose-specific tick treatments like they do for other veterinary animals, right? You know, a, a medicine you give your dog might kill your cat and vice versa. So it's got to be very species specific. Um, so it may just be that we're going to have moose at relatively low densities. One of the neat findings of similar studies that they've done, radio collaring moose in New Hampshire and Maine, is that once moose reach a density threshold, a lower threshold, they stop having issues with ticks. <clears throat> there aren't enough of the moose around to pass the ticks to each other, and you find that the moose are generally tick free below that density. So just to throw some numbers at you, they've found that at about 0.75 moose per square mile, about three quarters of a moose per square mile, they stop having problems with ticks. Right now in the Northeast Kingdom at the core of moose habitat, we're a little above that at about 1.05, so just a little over one. So it may very well be, and this is one of the things we'll be looking into the future, is that the solution to moose in a changing climate is actually to reduce their density a little bit, probably through hunting permits. Um, which you know, is probably going to be controversial, but it may not change the fact that it may be the right thing to do. Um, the moose, this particular moose that you can see, and I'll, I'll, I'll move on from this slide in a moment, it's a little bit gruesome, um, <clears throat> was fed on in its back half by coyotes. And the moose crew that I was with supposed, guessed, that it had probably been fed upon before it was dead. Um, so it's, it's a pretty awful death for these animals. And anything we can do to kind of uh, not have this be their fate would really be the more humane uh, treatment of moose. So that's a little bit of a bummer. Let's move on from that um, to some of the other uh, patterns that we're finding 
for climate change in Vermont. So one of the big ones is the unpredictable winter patterns. This winter, in my estimation, was amazing. I love winter. I love to ski. This has been a fantastic winter for me. But as we all know, this isn't the normal winter in Vermont lately, right? You see these unpredictable weather patterns where you get more rain events in the middle of winter. Sometimes you'll get like a late freak snowstorm in times of year, like you know May or later into the year. So the weather patterns are shifting towards unpredictability overall. <clears throat> Some people have referred to it not as global warming, but global weirding. Um, so that's, that's stressful for wildlife in general. A few of the things that, hold on, that affect is the idea of the timing of natural events, right? Wildlife have evolved slowly over a very long period of time. <clears throat> and they're used to things changing slowly in a way that they can adapt to. But climate change is happening so quickly that the timing of certain events, like when birds are coming back to try to nest, when the leaves are popping out, when the insects follow the leaves popping out, right? All of those things are getting slightly off each other, and it's sometimes hard for, uh, for, for wildlife to deal with that. So just as an example, we saw bluebirds and wood ducks at Dead Creek Wildlife Management Area, not too far from here. Uh, the bluebirds were exhibiting nesting behavior in mid-February last winter, which was a very different winter, right? Um, wood ducks were seen on the property earlier than we ever has, had historically seen them. Uh, a few years ago, <clears throat> one of our biologists witnessed turtles out basking, meaning that they're out on a rock warming up on Christmas Eve. There was a Christmas maybe four winters ago that was like 50 degrees right around Christmas. And turtles are just like, time to bask. Um, so it's those types of things that are difficult. This is actually a slide that I literally just added this morning because I was reading a study about this um, <clears throat> where they, they actually took Thoreau, uh, Henry David Thoreau's journals about when leaf out and certain events were happening. And they compared them to modern day and they found that Leaves are popping out around Walden Pond in Massachusetts on average two weeks earlier than they used to. But one of the things that they're finding is that um, spring wildflowers are not keeping up nearly as quickly, right? They're popping out about one week earlier, meaning that that's one fewer week of uh, having a canopy-free forest that the wildflowers are having to deal with, right? And it's energetically costly for these wildflowers to be covered up by the canopy like this. So again, those timing, different species can deal with that in different ways. One of the species that we're already seeing right here in Vermont that's dealing with this is bears. Bears are out and about more often in wintertime. We get those unpredictable, uh, you know, freak winter uh, rainstorms, and oftentimes it'll flood the den out of the bear, and the bear will be kind of get really uncomfortable and be out, um, you know, just kind of trying to not sit in a pool of water in the, in the middle of its den. Um, you get a, a really nice, cold, snowy winter, and this is what happens, is you get the den. This is um, what we're pretty sure is the entrance to a bear den. You can see all the hoar frost from the breath coming out here. But you get a nice, cold, snowy winter, and it's going to kind of seal in that den, keep the winds away, keep the warmer temperatures. <clears throat> snowpack, for wildlife at least, is very good insulator. So um, down here at the bottom of a snowpack, even just a couple of foot snowpack, it can be pretty close to the freezing point. It can be pretty close to 32 Fahrenheit even if it's negative 20 uh, in the air temperature. And that's a huge difference, right? That's a 50 degree difference. But imagine all these, uh, these nights and winters past where <clears throat> we'll get a winter rain event, it wipes out the snowpack, and then the temperatures plunge. And you think about all the small mammals that are down there at ground level that no longer have that insulative snowpack to deal with, right? And again, back to that timing of natural events. So, Species that change color for the winter, change into white, do that as a result of day length. They don't do it as a result of temperature or snow or things like that. So a snowshoe hare, the only defense that it knows is just stay still and try to blend until it gets to the point where it runs. I mean, obviously, they're very fast runners, but its initial defense is just stay still and hide and hope nobody can find me. Well, that's not going to work very well if you're a bright white animal on a brown background, right? One of my professors uh, from grad school, Scott Mills, uh, took this photo. This is one of the things he's studying, is w what effect <clears throat> this aspect of climate change is having on some of these species. And then that snowpack is going to create winners and losers as well. So this is a, a Vermont native species that is very well adapted to a nice deep snowpack. This is video that was shot on a game camera up in the Nullhegan Basin. And you can see as it walks by, look at those enormous back feet. So that's a lynx, Canada lynx, <clears throat> one of our native species in the state. And they do very well eating those snowshoe hares 
uh, when they can run atop of the snow, right? When um, there's less snow, their close competitor, bobcats, can outcompete them and actually push them out of territories, push them out of the areas, um, because they become more numerous. So these guys really have to rely on this advantage of these cold, deep, snowy winters, right, in order to outcompete bobcats. Invasive species are highly adaptable to those global weirding, to those unpredictable weathering events, right? Um, <clears throat> purple loosestrife, again, kind of like the leaf out there, finding purple loosestrife is adapting very well to climate change. It's blooming earlier in, early, in, earlier in the spring, but something like our native cattail, which a lot of species like red-winged blackbirds rely on, are not so flexible and adaptable. Um, they're not blooming, or they're not kind of coming out earlier in the year. So if you see a plant with green leaves in April, probably it's going to be an invasive species, right? In Vermont, something like honeysuckle or some of the earliest bloomers, almost all of them are, are, are usually invasive species. And then again, some of these forest pests that we're starting to see. Does anyone know what causes this one? Yeah, emerald ash borer. So this is the newest one to the state. Um, and this one is, again, cold limited. Uh, hemlock woolly adelgid and emerald ash borer, you know, they, <clears throat> they arrive by virtue of people moving them around, as we all well know. But one of the limiting factors on the northern end of these things is very, very cold winter temperatures. So as we get fewer of those really cold snaps, again, uh, emerald ash borer and hemlock woolly adelgid are going to be two of the ones that we're going to see kind of marching northward across the landscape. So a couple of things that we do to address this. One is something like uh, <clears throat> we do some controlled burns. We do them actually right out here on D at Dead Creek Wildlife Management Area um, as, as one of the many forms that we have of addressing some invasive plants. Um, and then another one is just the old-fashioned pole, right? Um, so does anyone know what this species here is that's all on this kayak? Water chestnut, exactly. So this is the one that if you get, get at early and aggressively, you can eradicate locally. But there are some that are really a lot more difficult. And it sounds like you guys are going to have an invasive species talk later in this series, so I won't go too much into this. But I think the take home message with this is that <clears throat> invasives are very flexible and adaptable by their very nature, right? So they don't care if it rains in the middle of winter or if the sun shines or whatever. You know, it's all good to them. They can deal with it. Another one of the effects that we're going to see from climate change is this increase in wildlife diseases. I would say this is going to be the one of the things that in the conservation world we're going to have to watch the most closely and can change things the most quickly. <clears throat> so in 2008, we found white nose syndrome in bats for the first time in the state. Um, was it 08 or 09 that we found them in Vermont? Does anyone remember? Zapata, do you remember? 08, yeah. So, and again, this is kind of one of those ones where for this one specifically, Kind of like um, emerald ash borer, it's hard to tell where things like globalization end and climate change begin. Because this one, by and large, was probably caused by people moving this fungus from Eastern Europe to our caves over here. But <clears throat> the general trend is that funguses, bacteria, um, you know, viruses, all of these things are going to be incubated to a higher degree um, in a warmer, wetter climate. And again, this is another one that we're finding, a fungal disease. This is our, our native timber rattlesnake again uh, with snake fungal disease, which is a very new one, even newer than white nose syndrome. And it's the same type of thing. It's this flaky white fungus that gets, gets on the fa face of timber rattlesnakes and a few other snake species <clears throat> can eventually get into their nostrils and down into their lungs and kill them. And so right now we're researching kind of which snake populations currently have this disease and what the extent of it is. And it's so new, I mean, it's literally called snake fungal disease. You know, that was just, people just named it that because it's, what else do you call it at that point? But it's, it's, it's a newly described phenomenon, and we're not, there's not a whole lot known about this or even what to do about it at this point. So our next climate phenomenon that we're looking at is increased precipitation. Here's the general trend of overall precipitation of all forms, snow and rain. Um, since 1960, you can see the trend line in Vermont here is up. But not only are we getting more precipitation, we're getting more of it all at once. So <clears throat> here's the trend line um, of intense storms. We get these really highly intense, aggressive, destructive storms more often, the tropical storm Irene's and things like that. And you can see, especially along the spine of the Green Mountains, we're seeing a, a very strong upward trend of these very intense storms. So one of the issues with that, <clears throat> um, not only to human infrastructure, but to natural infrastructure is just 
destruction of stream habitat, right? <clears throat> so streams do thrive on some level of disturbance, right? A tree falls over here, a boulder gets moved around, you get a sandbar that moves from one place to another, and that's fine, that's great, that's really good for all kinds of wildlife species. But when you get these massive, destructive flooding events that totally scour the entire stream bank and wipe out all the trees alongside of it, take out all the boulders and all the substrate and everything like that, think about all the things that that, that, um, <clears throat> that that's an issue for. So the fish are now exposed to the hot temperatures because the trees that used to shade the, tree, uh, the stream are gone. You know, the, the salamanders, the herps that, that were um, dormant at the bottom of the stream in January get totally scoured out and, and, and oftentimes killed as a result of these things, you know? The fish that were trying to lay eggs there in the spring or the fall whenever they're spawning, those get either covered in silt or they get washed downstream. So this can be really destructive at this, at this degree um, for a lot of different species. And again, going back to invasives, those massive flooding events are fantastic for some invasive species. So we all saw after Tropical Storm Irene, it was like, you know, uh, where is it? The Japanese knotweed over here was like in Boomtown. I mean, they loved this because Japanese knotweed, all it takes is a fragment of the plant, a piece of the leaf, a piece of the stalk, and it can establish a new colony in a new place. And so you think about one of those uh, massive storm events that comes down and scours the bank, grabs a big bunch of this, and then deposits it somewhere else, and now all of a sudden it spreads very well. Think about that versus one of like our native streamside trees that can't deal with just being washed away and then planting wherever it ends up. It doesn't work that way for a lot of our native species. And this is kind of neat because in a morbid kind of way, <clears throat> um, this is on Route 100 uh, on my way to work, and you've got Phragmites here on the right, and you've got Japanese knotweed here on the left, and they're kind of going in this head-to-head -head battle here. And every day for the last several years I drive by and I wonder which one is kind of making ground against the other because they're both highly invasive plant species. I think that this one's going to win because they cheat they have allelopathy, meaning that they put chemicals into the ground to try to kill other plant species around it. And so I think in the long term, they're going to beat out the, the Japanese knotweed. But I'm really curious to see who wins this one in the long term. So some of the things we're doing to address that in the conservation world again. Um, floodplain forests are going to be huge as a way of combating these massive precipitation events, right? So in areas like uh, Johnson Farm along the Connecticut River, we're planting native tree species to try to restore some of our floodplain forests, make sure that those banks are resistant to erosion. And then the big one, of course, <clears throat> is all of the wetlands in the state. So wetlands are incredibly important sources of water storage during these mass precipitation events. One of the great examples of this uh, is right down the road in Middlebury. And it's a story I'm sure many of you have heard before. During Tropical Storm Irene, Otter Creek jumped its banks in Rutland and caused massive damage in Rutland, but did not damage downtown Middlebury as a result of a lot of the wetland complexes in between. And kind of one of the fun conservation success stories of that is that those, many of those wetland complexes were actually created, restored by conservationists. They weren't even there before people came in and dug them out and plugged ditches and everything like that and created those wetland complexes. There's been a lot of effort, particularly along the banks of Otter Creek, to restore wetlands. So this is really, that was really kind of an incredible success story of what conservation can do not just for the wildlife species, but for, for people as well. So our next uh, big climate change effect of wildlife, and this is one that's a very touchy subject that I tread very lightly on, is the alternative energy footprint. <clears throat> so up until now, up until recently, we were basically kind of outsourcing our energy footprint, right? We would say someone else deal with the negative ecosystem consequences of the energy that we create. Now with alternative energy, it's kind of staring us in the face, right? We see the effects of the energy demands that we create right here on our own communities. Now this is one of those catch-22s because one of the solutions to climate change obviously is to reduce our energy consumption through the use of renewables, through alternative energies. Um, but they are not without their own consequences. So for example, uh, for uh, solar fields, a lot of those are placed in what was formerly incredibly productive grassland bird habitat. <clears throat> and then again, for some of the very controversial wind, uh, ridgeline wind development, you know, we talked about those places in the state that still have that core habitat in the state of Vermont, and most of those are found uh, in places where 
they want to put ridge, people want to put ridge line wind development in, right? <clears throat> so this is a great example of this. This is one of our biologists, Jackie Como, um, looking for radio collared bears uh, right here in this area where they have put these new towers right in Green Ma Southern Green Mountain National Forest. So this was the first wind energy proposal in the country, and I don't know if there have been since then, this was in 2012, <clears throat> inside a national forest. Um, the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department did an assessment of this and decided, or basically uh, found that this was a regionally important food area for bears, that bears were coming from you know, all over the area to feed on beech trees that were found on this ridgeline. And so as part of the permitting process, we opposed the development of this. Um, it was overruled. And so as part of that, we got, we got funding to do this study to radio color bears to see what effect this is going to have on these bears to have this beach stand basically removed and replaced with uh, wind turbines. And so here you can see uh, the biologist going in. We've got a tranquilized bear here, putting a radio collar in. And we're able to kind of follow that bear around and see, are they going to be totally displaced? Um, will they just be displaced during the construction phase and then eventually kind of come back in? Um, so we're, we're, we're still trying to see what the, what the deal with that is. One of the neat findings of that so far is that <clears throat> you know, it did confirm that this is actually a regional food source for bears. Bears, will be, uh, bears that spend time in Massachusetts or New York State will actually come to these ridgelines um, in the study area to feed on beech trees during high productive beech nut years. This is down in Searsburg, by the way, all the way against the Massachusetts border in far southern Vermont. <clears throat> And then this is the one that, to me, I find the scariest. So this is the climate effect that really kind of bugs me the most. Because I mentioned before, I love winters. I'm a big skier. I re really enjoy the climate of Vermont. I'm here for a reason. It's because I don't want to live in some place that's really hot all the time. And so this is from the IUCN, the International Union of Concerned Scientists. This is their projection of what Vermont's climate will generally be like by about the end of the century um, under two scenarios, under the low emission scenario <clears throat> and under the high emission scenario. So in the low emission scenario, that's the, like we get our act together and we do reduce emissions, right? The, we hold to the Paris Climate Accords, Kyoto, all of that stuff, really aggressively reduce emissions. Even in that scenario, they predict that our climate will look more like kind of the Ohio Valley and northern West Virginia. In our current trajectory, the higher emission scenario, they're predicting it'll be more like the Smoky Mountain region of, uh, Tennessee, kind of the, the far southern Appalachian. Now think about what effect that's going to have on things like our forests, right? Because there are very different plant species, not to mention animal species, that you find in the southern Appalachians than you do up here in the northern Appalachians, right? So there's a lot of questions about, you know, is it even, would it be ethical to start taking species that are on isolated mountaintops that really have no corridor to move themselves northward and start physically moving plants so that you can create forests, you can create <clears throat> you know, kind of these microcosms, these little ecosystems that are well adapted to what the climate will be. Um, there was a study in science that looked at 4,000 different species globally and found that more than, uh, roughly half of them have already shifted their ranges as a response to climate change. And it's about, what is it, 30, uh, what is it, oh, there it is, 10 miles per decade that they're moving northward, northern species, and about 30 feet higher in elevation every decade, right? So they're finding species are already responding, including tree species, are already responding to these shifting forests. Now, one of the species that's kind of the flagship for this in Vermont that's going to be the most effective to buy this is our Bicknell's thrush. This is a bird species that really only nests on the very, very highest ridge lines <clears throat> of the northeastern, uh, northeastern United States and eastern Canada. This is a species that is a fir tree obligate, right? Um, they found that fir trees, for every degree Celsius that you raise, move up about 500 feet in elevation. Well, we don't have super high mountains here in New England, as we all know, and there's not a lot of space for them to go, continue to go up, right? So this is one of the species that our, uh, our friends over at Vermont Center for Eco Studies have been monitoring very closely, and they're trying to see what kind of effect that climate change is going to have on these guys. But this loss of habitat, this is really the big one. This is the one that we're going to be kind of working on the most as a response to climate change. They're already finding, by the way, this is the Bicknell's thrush. There's a closely related thrush species. They all look kind of like this, as birders know, right? You've got kind of a, a brown bird with kind of some spots on the chest and the amount of spots. 
dictates which species it is, and, and the song and other things. But so Swainson's thrush is kind of the middle elevation, and the Vermont Center for Eco Studies scientists are already finding that Swainson's thrush are moving higher in elevation in terms of where they're nesting and pushing into the habitat of the big nose thrush. So why does that loss of habitat matter? Well, this is that map again, right? Some of these places uh, that still have this large tracts of core habitat. And it's not that there's just less habitat um, with this development pattern. It's that there's less useful habitat, right? So the analogy I like to make is imagine you're out in a life raft. You're on a ship that is sunk. You're floating around in the ocean on a little life raft. And you spot land in the distance, right? Now, would you rather wash up on this island or this island, right? Obviously, you're going to want to wash up on this second island, the one that's larger, that's going to have a more diverse range of resources for you, right? On this first one, you can see there's about two little trees there. And once you've eaten the coconuts out of those two trees, you're probably not going to have a lot left, right? These bigger islands are going to have water. They're going to have food. They're going to allow you to move around seasonally when one fr tree is fruiting and another one is not, right? It's the exact same thing with wildlife, right? We're creating these little tiny islands for them. And in order to get from one island to the other, they don't swim the ocean. They have to run across our infrastructure. This is not going to end badly. This is not going to be a horror show here. <clears throat> so some friends of mine over at New England Cable News got this great footage of these two bear cubs running across the road here. This is up by uh, Trap Family Lodge up in the Stowe area. Right? And this is kind of the daily occurrence for wildlife. So the analogy I like to make is imagine when you wake up in the morning to, to get between your bed and the bathroom to go use the toilet and then go downstairs for some coffee, you have to dash across a highway to do it, right? That's kind of the reality for wildlife with our development pattern. And not every species is so lucky, right? So not all of them make it as we well know. So this is where, this is going to be one of the biggest responses that we're really going to need to do um, to conserve wildlife in a changing climate. Because wildlife are going to need to move from one place to the other as they're becoming increasingly stressed, <clears throat> as the pressures of climate change are on them. Um, and they're also going to need to generally be able to migrate across the landscape as a result of climate change. They're going to need to be able to shift their range to be where they need to be. So this is where the talk kind of starts to turn things around towards the positive. I've bummed you all out for about half an hour now. And now we're going to start looking at some solutions, right? So there's a couple things we're doing for this. One is that we're really look, working to create uh, connecting habitats. We work with partners like the Nature Conservancy and VTRANS, the transportation agency in the state. And we're really looking to create permeable infrastructure, we call it. So roads and bridges and train trestles and all of these different things that allow wildlife to move from one place to another. So here's some game camera footage of a bobcat um, going under an underpass. This is a, an underpass that was created for wildlife down on Route 9 uh, in the southern part of the state. So what we've done is basically, <clears throat> when they rebuilt the bridge, they kind of put some land here on the edge so that instead of going up over the road, wildlife can go under the road, which is obviously safer for drivers too, right? Really important on that end. But it gives them a, kind of a substrate to walk on. So you can see there's a sow bear with two cubs on this one. And one of the really exciting findings as we were going through this footage is that in Searsburg, Vermont, this is a species that uh, is making a return to the presentation from earlier on with big feet in the back, the Canada lynx, found all the way across the state from the core of their habitat up in the Northeast Kingdom. So this was amazing when they were going through these game camera photos, uh, photos to see a Canada lynx using a wildlife underpass that had been created specifically to allow wildlife to move safely across the state, right? You've got a species that clearly has made it safely from the core of their habitat in the kingdom all the way to the far southern part of Vermont. So this is, this is really exciting stuff to see. And this was one uh, not too, too far from here in Moncton that was created for frogs and salamanders. So all of those are salamanders moving out along. This is one hour's worth of footage condensed into 15 seconds. <clears throat> and I think Jim Andrews with the Herp Atlas, the Vermont Reptile and Finneap Atlas, tell, says me, uh, has, has said that it's something like 1,000 uh, different salamanders that you can see in that one footage. I mean, it's just incredible, the numbers. Um, not only will that have a population level effect on a local frog or amphibian population with that many of them getting squished, but apparently in some places in the state, this can create a hazard to drivers. It's like, a, like an icy road slick of dead frogs and salamanders, right? 
So this type of infrastructure is incredibly important to allow wildlife to move safely, um, to meet their needs from season to season, and again, to shift their ranges in response to climate change. And it's not gonna be just terrestrial wildlife they're gonna need to shift. So think about um, our trout species that are very cold water adapted. So they're gonna need to move higher and higher up into the mountains. Remember we talked about those 90 degree summer days. <clears throat> they're gonna need to move higher and higher up into the mountains and find cool shady water in response to that, those hot summer temperatures. And so again, we're working with partners to try to make the transportation infrastructure permeable to them too. So this is a before and after of the same bridge. You can see a culvert that's raised that really would have been impermeable to a trout that's trying to move upstream and find those cool summer waters in order to survive. <clears throat> And as much as possible, we're really trying to create a natural stream bed so that um, a trout could swim right up there. I know in this photo it looks like just rocks and leaves, but trust me, there is water under there too. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the, the, the first thing we're doing, is we're making the landscape permeable so that um, wildlife are able to move in response to climate change. And the second, and this is kind of a big one, is that we're taking a statewide approach to maintaining diverse and connected habitats in Vermont. Um, it's called Vermont Conservation Design. And so this is where things can get a little sciencey. Um, but basically, it's our way of taking this kind of like whole health approach to the landscape. So previously, there was kind of this emergency room style approach to conservation, right? You looked one species to the next. Does it need to be listed on the endangered species list? Do we need to put a lot of energy into this individual species? This is our way of kind of looking at, you know, if, if you make the healthcare analogy of things like smoking and food and exercise and like all of these things that you need to have a healthy lifestyle. So this is all of the things that we think we're gonna need to have a healthy ecosystem, right? All of the different natural community types and landscape features um, and core habitat blocks and all of those things that we're gonna need to conserve if we wanna maintain biodiversity in the future. And this is something that um, I have had nothing to do with designing and I will say is absolutely at the forefront of conservation that we are doing here in Vermont and that other states are soon gonna be emulating. And this is incredible work by some of our scientists and scientists at partner organizations too. This is not just uh, staff at Fish and Wildlife Department. But basically, it's our way of looking at various scales across the landscape and saying, if we can, ser if we can serve this whole suite of natural features, we drastically increase our likelihood that we're gonna maintain biodiversity in the future, right? And so we do that at different scales. We do that at that big forest block scale from that statewide map I showed you. We do it at the natural community scale. <clears throat> and then just conserving all that habitat and all those connections and linkages and streams and all that, for some species that's not gonna be enough. For some species we're actually gonna still need to pay species specific attention. So for example, Peregrine falcons, it's not enough just to conserve the cliffs that they need to nest on. You also need to put some conservation attention into keeping people away from those cliffs during our nesting season, right? So that's gonna be the type of species that we're always gonna to have to have this species-specific scale. But for example, like a black-throated blue warbler, you might literally never need to do anything for conservation for other than conserve the habitat that it needs to survive. That beyond that, it's gonna do it on its own, right? So this is our way of kind of creating this ecologically functional landscape. And this is kind of what it looks like when you put it all together. So I tried to look at this and flash back and forth before this, but I'm pretty sure we're kind of right in this area, right? Is that pretty close or are we down just a little bit lower here in Ritland? A little bit west, so we start to get where it's a little... Furthest point west on the map. Furthest point west on the map. Oh, right there? Oh, interesting. So, but that's, that's cool, that's a good markage, marker. Um, but yeah, I mean, you guys are definitely right here in one of these highly ecologically important areas. And you can tell, I mean, you, you go outside and there's amazing, incredible habitat around here, right? Um, but again, it's our way of maintaining the highest confidence that we're gonna keep an ecologically functional landscape as a result of a changing climate. This is kind of our approach to it. So, those pinch points, right? Those connections. Just to, it's, it's easy to talk about how important they are. But this video, I think, this is one that went viral last year on YouTube. It's called The Log, and it shows how just a log, right? A little bridge connecting two edges of habitat can funnel all of these wildlife, all these different species into it. So let's count and see how many different species we can see here. 
So you had the one bear there, that was, I think that was the boar, and then now you got the sow, and cub number one, cub number two. And give it a minute, here comes cub number three. So just one log in the forest has a linkage, and you can see how much usage it gets. So there's a bobcat, you got some raccoons. There's a lumbering porcupine. <clears throat> I believe it's a barred owl, right? Is that an eastern screech or a sawwet? Sawwet? It's kind of hard to tell. Great blue heron. There's our bear taking a bath again. Red tail hawk. Probably looking for mice that they know are going to be using that bridge to get from one side to the other. There's a coyote. A little muskrat there. That was I think that was a fisher running by there before real quick. Where is this? So this is in Pennsylvania. But this this was kind of going all over the internet because this guy took one year of game camera footage on this log and these are all the different species. Belted kingfisher, more raccoons. Wood duck. A couple of deer not using the log, obviously, although it'll be fun to kind of watch them try to make, try to make it across on the log. <clears throat> There's a beaver dragging a log or dragging a branch there. And this is the best. I love this. Wait for it. <laughs> and then we've come full circle back to the sow with cubs. So you can see those little linkages, right? Imagine a, a patch of forested habitat between two larger blocks are like those logs, that log, right? That's how important those, those connections are. And that's how important those connections are going to be to wildlife that's inc increasingly stressed by climate change. <clears throat> so what can we all do about it? Well, the, the biggest one is promoting hab wildlife habitat on your land. If you are a landowner, do everything you can to promote wildlife habitat on it. Vermont is about 83% privately held, meaning that private landowners have to be in the mix in order to create quality wildlife habitat. Our best response to a, a changing climate is to maintain healthy and connected habitats. If you remember nothing about, else about this talk 10 years from now, I want you to remember that, that this is our best response to maintaining uh, healthy ecosystems and changing climate. And we can help with this. There are all kinds of programs um, from the county forester that will come out to we have wildlife biologists who will come out on people's property and do walks with them and kind of give them ideas on how to promote quality habitat. For landowners of a certain size, for certain types of, of habitat improvements, there are actually federal programs that will not only pay for our time to go out there and walk with you, but will actually pay for the habitat upgrades. So if we said, Oh, you've got like a good marsh here, or you've got like a good you know, forest here. If we <clears throat> did a little bit of cutting, we could create some really good early successional habitats for golden wing warblers or, or species like that. They'll actually pay to have that work done on certain size properties. So there are all kinds of resources out there for people to create quality wildlife habitat on their property. And here's the big one. Right? As, as, as uh, Cartock, Click and Clack called it, the shameless commerce division of the talk tonight. Support habitat conservation in Vermont. It is so important, right? So Vermont uh, Fish and Wildlife, we have the Habitat Stamp, which was a program that was just created in 2015. It's $15, and all of the proceeds go directly into habitat conservation in Vermont, both on uh, public lands through acquisition and on private lands. Um, but it, it, there's a new Habitat Stamp every year, and we really hope that people will go out and buy one every year. But I don't want to just put in a plug for us. There are all kinds of great organizations that are doing incredible habitat work uh, here in Vermont. The Nature Conservancy, Vermont Land Trust, groups like Ducks Unlimited and Trout Unlimited uh, do incredible work for wetlands and streams, respectively. <clears throat> so I think we, you know, all of us, myself included for this, need to put our money where our mouth is and say that this is important. It's worth spending money on uh, to conserve wildlife habitat. So again, let's swoop even farther out of the doldrums of all of the bad news tonight and end with a little bit of inspiration because there has been a lot of bad news. There's a lot of bummer stuff in here, right? But 
there are solutions to some of these things, and we can do this, and we know we can do this because we've done it before, right? We've brought species back from the brink. So here's a couple of peregrine falcon chicks, the fastest bird on earth, right? What is it, over 200 miles an hour that they will strike their prey out of the sky, sometimes knocking them cold. And these were on the brink of no longer being in Vermont, right? In 2005, through all of the work of conservationists, they were delisted and are now becoming a relatively common species in the state, right? <clears throat> um, you know, peregrine falcons are one of those species that really reminds me of Thoreau's quote about in wildness is the preservation of the world, right? And they're not the only ones that we've brought back. So osprey, also delisted in 2005, again, used to be very uh, rare in the state and are now bordering on being a pest in some places, right? They're so common. These guys, our friends the bald eagles, are, are getting very close to being downlisted or potentially delisted in the near future, near future. And just as a service to bald eagles, let's listen to a nice bald eagle call here. Wait for it. Uh, is that a bald eagle call? What is that? Red tailed red hawk. But in every movie, they put a red tailed hawk call in behind a bald eagle. And we need to write that wrong tonight. That is not a bald eagle call. Ready? That's a bald eagle call. Now you can see why they may have replaced it with the red tailed hawk call, right? You got the classic like western with like John Wayne in the back of the horse and the eagle soaring around and then you hear the ee -tee 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 -tee, right? A little less dramatic than the bald eagles. But that aside, these are getting very close to being delisted because of the great conservation work of pe people pulling together. And it's not just species, right? Habitat too. In 2020, we're going to celebrate the 100th year of wildlife management areas in Vermont. So this is Sandbar Wildlife Management Area. It's what you see as you drive out on the causeway <clears throat> out to um, the islands. Um, and it was conserved 99 years ago. So we've been doing this for nearly a century, conserving habitat. This was the first habitat conserved specifically for wildlife in a state east of the Mississippi. So we've been doing this for a long time, and there are successes. And these places, as we all know, are vitally important, not just for wildlife, but for us, right? These are these places we finally get to kind of slow down look around, move at the speed of a paddle, right? The places where we kind of restore our connection with nature and catch our dinner, or pass that connection down to the next generation of people who have that direct association with nature. To me, long-eared owls are the epitome of you never know what's out there. You might, they're out there even if you don't see them. So this is a great example to me. Uh, I took my daughter owl banding. We do an owl banding thing down near Dead Creek in the fall, and I took her, that she's four years old, and staying up late enough to see owls at all was a big deal. We left at 10.20, and at 10.22, they caught a long-eared owl. So we just missed it by that much. But I never see long-eared owls in the wild, but the fact that they caught one in this net, the fact that they're out there at all, means that there's so much, that, that links that made it all the way across the state that nobody had seen, right? Means that there are wildlife that are out there that we don't necessarily always see. And some of them have been kind of quietly going about their business unchanged since the time of the dinosaurs, right? Some of them really make me marvel at their diversity. So we've got about two dozen species of sparrows in Vermont, all with a different song. Two dozen, dozen species of warblers, all with their own unique song. Really incredible. <clears throat> and some of them, like my friend the timber rattlesnake, really remind us of the wildness that remains here in Vermont, <clears throat> right? Of a time when things weren't so tame, when there wasn't so much kind of paved and lawn, and there was just sheer wildness this state. And it's still here. And to me, there's no better example of that wildness <clears throat> than loons. So this is another species that we brought back from the brink of near extinction in Vermont. And we're delisted along with the other two in 2005. I think there's no sound that epitomizes the wildness of Vermont than the call of the loon. It's just haunting, right? Think about how much we would lose if we couldn't hear that in the future. And so I just want to finish with, with kind of why this is so important to me. So this Wendell Berry quote that I love, that a true conservationist knows that the world is not given by his ancestors, but borrowed from his children. 
And I think that the best legacy that we can leave to our children is an inhabitable world with all the incredible species that we have. Um, so with that, I'll take questions. It looks like the gentleman in the back already had a question right there. Yeah. Yeah, in the summertime? Isn't that neat? Do you know the different calls, <clears throat> the different types of calls of the loons? So there's, there's that one, which is the whale, right? And then there's the yodel. Can anyone do a loon yodel? No? What is it? So they've got four different types. And I started down this path, and now I've got to finish it, right? But there's the whale, there's the yodel. Oh, there's like a territorial one. Tremolo, yes. And then there's a fourth, the hoot. The hoot are the four different types, and they all mean slightly different. And uh, what's the one that the males use to establish their territory? It's, not the, it's the tremolo, right? Yeah. And so apparently each male has its own tremolo, their own unique identifying tremolo, and that males will actually change their tremolo moving from one pond to the other. I read about that recently. So pretty incredible stuff, huh? Yes, Ms. Meyer. Can you uh, repeat each question after someone asks a question so that everyone can I can. Thanks. Yes. So I was asked to repeat <laughs> each question. <laughs> All right, other questions? Yes. Where can you go here, Whipperwill, today here in Vermont? Where can you go for what? To hear a whippoorwill. I've heard one in like 40 years. Yeah. Yeah, so the Snake Mountain area. Yep. I've heard them uh, along Lake Champlain. John, do you happen to know? I think we've got some in the southern Connecticut Valley too right now. Whippoorwills. I think those are the two places. There's like the Champlain Valley and the Connecticut. And mostly in the southern Connecticut Valley is where they think they are. Although I don't think they're quite thought to be as numerous there. But uh, like Franklin County, Addison County. And what type of vegetation do they need? You know, they're a ground nester, and I'm not 100% sure, but there are people here who could probably answer that. Well, the, the southern part of Snake Mountain, where uh, Forest Road goes on, that's, I live right there, and they live there. That was We used to have a lot of two here along the mountain. Yep. We had a lot of early succession back in the 50s and 60s. Yeah, yeah. They're definitely one of the species that has has declined pretty profoundly in the state. Oh yeah, it's such a neat sound, huh? I mean, it's it's kind of like the you know a nighttime version of the loon whale, although loons whale at night as well, but. Right, but it's it's kind of like the the epitome of the summer night is hearing that. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, how much? I went away. I just went away. Sure. And I went back to a place where I hadn't been in ten years, and I had brought my son there. Ten. Ten years ago and a few years before that, years ago, yep. to show him like the underwater world. Yeah. And the reefs, like I was blowing my eyes up, like because the places I was used to snorkel oh. were totally. They were like a third of the fish, and they were the reefs were not colorful anymore. Right. And they were just, so it, was, it just got me really thinking. Like in Vermont, we do care about this stuff. Right. And we do realize the science is real. But um, there's still half our country that's trying to make it look like a hoax. And right. The world is very slow, and like we're so in a bubble here. Mm. We're so lucky. Right. And you go around to the, to the rest of the world, and, and also like the that used to be hardly anything there was totally built up. I mean, it's just... Yeah. So, I wonder, you know, <clears throat> how much work are you, can we be, are you guys, with these projects, are they also caring about, you know, working with you from other states and maybe Canada?
Sure. That's, so, that's a great question. So there's a, f a few things there, the, the, a lot of great questions actually. So one is absolutely we do work regionally. We work with, we work with Quebec and you know, there's uh, the Staying Connected Initiative is a great uh, kind of collective partnership of states um, trying to connect habitat from the Adirondacks all the way up through Canada, through Nova Scotia, um, and create these corridors so that wildlife can migrate. Because you know, we find for bears and lynx and a lot of these species, they're, they're long distance migrators and they need those corridors. And so we do work collectively with them. We work collectively uh, with all of the states on um, management of like games, game birds, so like ducks and things like that. There's a flyway and we work collectively on that to make sure that you know, if one state is not following the rules or, or one province and over harvesting game birds that there will be issues. And so in those cases we do work collectively. In terms of things like you know, coral reefs in the areas of the world, you know, it's a tough thing and I'm sure we all struggled with this going into conservation, those of us in the room that do, whether to work in a place like Vermont um, that is doing very well with its conservation and, and we're just kind of marginally making it just a little bit better by being here or working in a place where conservation is a disaster and it's like an uphill battle every step of the way. And maybe it's a little bit of a cop out working in conservation here in Vermont where we should be winning these places where they're, they're blasting the coral reefs and, and losing species left and right, but. but right. And, and I think one of, the, one of the things is that to some degree we are at the, and, and I say this, you know, not because I'm a part of it, but because of this larger conservation community that Vermont really is at the forefront of a lot of these conservation initiatives. And I think that things that we do from like the transportation infrastructure stuff to this holistic statewide approach to habitat conservation are going to be modeled in other places. And I think that that's the type of thing that will spiral out and have conservation, uh, positive conservation outcomes in other parts of the world. Um, the, we just globally lost uh, to extinction um, a porpoise species in 2018. Um, they, they tried like crazy. It was off the coast of Mexico. It was uh, a, a porpoise that liked to live in murky, muddy waters at the uh, mouths of streams. And it finally went extinct late last year. Um, and I read an article written by one of the conservation scientists that was working on that. And he was saying that, <clears throat> you know, in the United States, kind of like we outsourced our energy consumption, we're outsourcing our extinctions, right? So, so that we can have, you know, frozen, um, what do you call it, frozen shrimp at the Trader Joe's, you know, they're destroying mangroves halfway around the world um, and that type of thing. And so there are a lot of conservation issues that we don't see that we contribute to. don't see. Yes. Yep. Damage in the other places. Like, right. They don't see, even the people that live in the other places don't. They don't go out and snorkel in their own backyards. So yeah. They don't know what the reef, even they don't know what the yeah. reef looked like 10 years ago. So, so I, would, I would say that the best thing we can do with that is we are wealthy in species in the United States, but we are also wealthy in money and capital. And one of the best things we can do is contribute to organizations like the Nature Conservancy and groups like that that have these global conservation impacts so that, you know, we're not just outsourcing. Our, our extinctions, we're also putting our money where our mouth is and contributing to conservation in these other parts of the world where they don't have the access to resources we do. I think that's kind of my answer to that is the best way we can do it. Yeah. Um, what's the situation with insects? Right. I mean, you used to fly along and your twin covered The moth snowstorm, right? Yeah. 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 Sure. So the, the question uh, was what's the, what's the story with insects these days and you know there have been a couple of landmark studies that have come out just in the last year about kind of global decline in insects um, and what effect that's going to have. Um, that is getting really outside the realm of my particular expertise um, but my understanding is that you know that that's going to be one of the major issues because it's not just the insects themselves, it's the role that they play in the, ecos in the ecosystem, right? Insects are as numerous as they are for a reason and that's because they, they affect a lot of other things and a lot of other things eat them. 
So think about things like bats and birds, you know, um, small mammals, all kinds of different things, you know, frogs and reptiles that will eat insects. Um, you know, one of the ones, uh, brook, trout. brook trout, I mean, all kinds of things. I mean, there are, you know, the radiating effects of that are enormous. One of the things that I read recently that there was a study that found that a lot of the pollinator insects, at least, are doing better of all places in urban areas because they're staying away from the pesticides of the rural areas. Um, so they're finding that to some degree, like urban areas in some parts of the country are little o oases for insects where they're not just getting pummeled by you know, aerial applications of pesticides. Um, so one, again, that what can you do for it? One of the best things that they recommend is not um, using uh, pesticides that have neonicotinoids in them um, and not buying plants from a nursery that have been treated with neonicotinoids because that's something that actually is injected in the plant. The plant basically, and again, I'm not sure how this works, but the plant has it within itself, like kind of for the life of the plant, like an ornamental. And any insects that come and feed on that plant attempt to end up dying from that neonicotinoid even years after the treatment. So, yeah. Yeah. Um. Uh, can I turn that back to the crew in the back? Does anybody else know? Uh, so the question was, is there currently being a study conducted on landscape level connectivity and uh, the effects of alternative energy? Um, do you know anything, John? There, there's a lot of studies. I'm sure, yeah. There's a lot of studies going on, uh, but as far as the landscape level piece, not exactly. Um, yeah, there are big questions about large scale solar facilities, wind facilities, and where they're placed, you know, picking wind facilities along ridge lines, like those same ridge lines that birds and bats are using to migrate. Uh, so it's, it's a big question. It's the answers that we're coming into a are not very really efficient. Yeah. So there's not a, in developing the conservation design, is there a systematic effort to kind of see how that can be integrated with the, getting the model? There's still some, there's, as part of an early phase of developing that, we started trying to identify places where alternative energy like wind uh, yeah. would not be ideal. Yeah. Yeah. Trying to find where it should be as much, it's a different question that there's just not the resources. And I, and I don't know that Vermont Conservation Design itself has explicitly uh, looked at alternative energy. I think for that, it's, it's, it's not, I don't know how to phrase this per se, but like it's not focusing on the negatives, it's focusing on the positive. So it doesn't matter what the destruction of that habitat is, it's just don't destroy this habitat, however you're going to do it. So alternative energy would be one of the ways, but housing development or roads or any of those other things. Does that make sense? So in other words, they still have kind of the core habitats that they're looking to. Mm. Um, or if you're in a community, you know, not a great solar panel place, maybe in a little community you can have a little, you know, you, you, it, what's much more distributed. And we start there. Right. You know, doing these huge projects is right. not the way that I envision the alternative energy to take place in this state. So, so from a wildlife perspective, I would say this, and that's, that's a good point, that, you know, before we start putting things in these core habitat areas, you know, all of the box stores need to be covered with, with solar panels, all of the parking lots, our own houses and roofs. Like, think about those places from a wildlife perspective that are already developed. They're going to have minimal impact on habitat that's currently there. And, and another one is the idea of efficiency. Bill McKibben puts it well. He says, we need to stop heating the outdoors, right? So we need to be looking at ways to, make, to demand less energy in the first place. I'll turn it back over to you. Yes. I, I wonder, in the grand scheme of things, when we talk about the work of cons 
conservation. And the rate at which we try to accomplish it with the resources that we have, at what point do we start worrying about those kinds of efforts just being overtaken by the rate at which you know, industrial societies making incursions into and changing the wildlife, you know, sort of beyond the point of no return. Right. Boy, that's a big question. Uh, I think it is kind of the core question. I mean, I think, you know, I heard a, a let me answer it in a slightly roundabout way. I heard a great interview about alternative energy, one of those hour-long call-in shows where they have, you know, and it was one of the, the national call-in shows. And they were talking about all the different forms of alternative energy and how they're adding this and that and all that. And at the end, you know, they have got the top experts in the country. And at the end, they're like, so how, wh how much of our energy usage is this going to replace? And the guy was like, oh, this isn't going to replace any of our energy uses. This is just going to keep up with the increase in our demand in our energy uses. At best, it'll just level it off, right? And I would say that the same, to some degree, might be true for the conservation work we do, right? Um, that, that kind of morbidly, you know, our best conservation efforts are at best going to level things off, right? There are going to be a few species like that that we can recover. Um, you know, in Vermont and in the developed world in general, we're doing pretty well, especially here in North America. Um, but I think that we're going to continue seeing this sixth great extinction globally as a result of industrialization, as a result of the way that we use the face of the earth. And I think that the best we can hope for at this point is to kind of slow it down. So, but let's do it anyway. Yeah. Positive. <laughs> Tom, thank you for sobering information yeah. and also for ideas of what we could do better. So yeah. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, guys. And, and can I just throw in there that I, I apologize to them both, but I have two of my colleagues, Nicole Meyer and uh, John Cart here tonight, who are every bit as much experts as I am, and that was why I kept tossing the random people in the back the questions, because they know as much or more than I do about any of these things. So I appreciate their input as well. I apologize for not introducing them at the beginning.